Hi, I'm Rev. Wendy Craig Purcell here at the Unity Center in San Diego. Thank you so much for watching today. If you'd like to support the work that we do here, please consider making a contribution. Go to our website. It's easy to do. Thank you in advance for that contribution. So after the storm, what now? I don't know if you are asking yourself that question, but I've been asking myself that question for myself personally and for our community and for our world as well. You know, what, what now? What do we want to do? How do we want to be? Who do we want to be? All last week, I attended our annual Unity Ministers uh, Convention. It was virtual this year. Last year, we weren't able to hold it at all, but we held it virtually this year. And our worldwide board is in that question for unity as a movement. As I listen to my other Unity Minister colleagues, they are deep in the question for their communities. Our board had its long board meeting um, just yesterday, and we are in the question, you know, who do we want to be now? What is Spirit calling us to do? What is Spirit calling us to be? And, and who do we bring along with us? How do we do what, what seems to be wanting to happen? What I personally am quite clear about is it wants to be something new. This is such an opportunity for us individually as a community, as a world, to say, what do we want now? We stand on a teaching that is all about faith and about practice and about principle. We know the power of the spoken word. We know that consciousness creates. We know that everything is created twice, first in mind and then in form. So when we ask ourselves deep, questions such as this at such a pivotal time, what now? And we listen, and then we move forward in faith step by step. We get to create something new and different. Yes, we transcend, but still include the good that was in existence before. We don't leave that behind. We bring that with us. But we also recognize the pieces of our world, the pieces of our lives, the areas of our world, the areas of our lives that weren't working. And so in asking ourselves those deeper questions, what are some of the practices that can help us come up with our answers, not somebody else's answers? You don't need somebody else to answer your deep personal philosophical questions. You need to have your own answers. And to trust, just as the song was saying in part, that there is something in you that will guide you and tell you what those right answers are for you. So there are three practices that I want to share with you this morning. The practices are these. And I smiled every time, actually, this week as I was looking over my lesson. I smiled to myself because I thought, I really like these ideas. I like these practices. Um, they feel very, I feel very at home in them, but they also challenge and inspire me. And they, they are these three things. Say yes to life. Say that with me. Say yes to life. The second, remain open and curious. Say that with me. Remain open and curious. And the third is stay teachable and humble. Together, stay teachable and humble. And as I was thinking about each of those every day this week, different people in my life came to my mind, people that have inspired me or modeled some of these things for me to say yes to life to be open and curious, to stay teachable. So we're going to look at the first one, say yes to life. A few years ago, I happened upon a book that I really liked, and I listened to the entire book. Most of the time now I listen to books because I, I tend to fall asleep now if I try to read them at the end of a very long day. So I'm grateful for Audible and listening while I'm on my morning walk. And the book I found was a book entitled Say Yes, say yes. It's by Shonda, Shonda Rhimes, the creator of Grey's Anatomy. And it was, it's a very poignant, funny, and practical book about her decision to spend an entire year saying yes to whatever life brought to her. And sometimes the yes was easy to give, and sometimes the yes was difficult to give. 
but her commitment was to say yes. And then the book kind of chronicles the amazing things that unfolded in her life as she was willing to meet life as it was coming and to say yes rather than saying no. I think there's even an exercise in that book or another book I've, I've read that talks about just saying those words, yes, no, over in your mind and noticing how, noticing how they feel in your body. Notice how it feels when you say yes to life and notice how it feels when you say no to life. Now sidebar here, please know that there are absolutely times that it is right and appropriate to say no. We don't ever say yes to harm, to to somebody doing something to us that is wrong, to being violated. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking from a different place. To look at what life seems to be bringing into your sphere of reference to look at and to see if some part of you can say yes to that and where that yes might lead. In theater, there is an exercise for improvisational acting. And as I understand what the exercise is, it is the practice that when an actor and actress are, are participating in this particular exercise, no matter what the actress says or does, the other person must say yes to it. Either literally yes or some way respond in the affirmative to move with the energy and the idea that is flowing, very much like in improv. I think improv itself can be a deeply spiritual practice of just being so in the moment and being willing to find a way to say yes to what is coming your way and work with it and build upon it. And in improv, some of the most creative um, uh, sessions are because of that energy that moves when there's that mystery of that exchange of idea and possibility and the other saying yes to it and being willing to build upon it. In more personal ways or practical ways, what it's like in our own lives is being aware of what seems to be coming either to us or through us that is a possibility or an opportunity and being willing to say yes and see where it takes us. I think about what was moving inside of me shortly after the, the um, Unite the Right riots in Charlottesville in 2017. And I called together our black and African American members after that and I said, I, I, I'm, I'm worried and I, I wanna know is there anything that the Unity Center can do in terms of our goodwill, our resources, our creativity to help create a more socially just world. And so there was something moving in me that I was willing to say yes to and did and sat with our black members for six months. Some of you know this story, I won't go into all of it, but sat and listened and that yes to that that was I didn't create it, it was just there. Spirit put it in me. Does this make sense? You've had this, it's maybe not the same thing that Spirit has put in you, but it got put in me and I said yes without any real knowing where that was going to go. And it has resulted now to a place where the Unity Center is helping to birth a whole institute, a nonprofit institute dedicated to racial literacy and to closing the racial wealth gap through literacy programs, through social enterprise programs. Part of what I think is a mystery and the power of our teaching is when we are willing to say yes to something that feels as if spirit is putting it in our heart or our mind, is even when we don't have the agenda because we can't, we can't know all the places we're going to go or all the things that are going to happen. But what we can know and what we must trust is Spirit's guidance. That if we do our small part, we will be shown what the next part is. And then we'll get another inkling of what the following step is. It's that saying yes to life. I think of the fact that you and I are sitting in something called the Unity Center. We are here because Myrtle Fillmore, our co-founder, 
the age of her mid-40s, was diagnosed with tuberculosis, was given two years to live. She said no to that prognosis, and she said yes to trying to figure out what could she do. And that yes led her to a yes in terms of thinking about her body in a different way, thinking about how she would pray and meditate, saying yes to a different way of thinking is what brought about her literal physical healing that resulted in her living until she was 86 years old. Do you think it was important she said yes to that change? I do. I kind of like unity, do you? I kind of like how my life has worked better ever since I have stumbled, or actually I didn't stumble, I was drugged into my first, not drugged like in drugs, but dragged, past tense of two drag, right? Into a unity church by my grandmother, whom I loved and adored. I'm so glad I said yes, even though it was a reluctant yes. I'm glad Myrtle said yes to a different way of thinking about herself. So as we stand at this pivotal time of coming out of, I don't even know what to call the pandemic, but coming out of this, we have an opportunity to really be deep in the question of what do we want to be? What do you want your life to be? How do you want to be? Who do you want to be? And what, as you ask those questions, what seems to kind of come up for you in meditation or in a flash of thinking? And can you, will you be willing to say yes to it and see where it takes you? I bet if you're willing to say yes and keep saying yes, you're going to see some amazing things unfold for yourself and for those that love you and cherish you. You can be an inspiration in that way to others. The second practice, do you remember what it was? Remain, I'll help you. Remain open and curious. Remain open and curious. I think of my dad, and we had a challenging relationship. Some of you in this room knew my dad, and, and I won't even go there. Anyway, and he was a wonderful man. He, he was. I learned so much from him. And in many ways, he was an important teacher, not always purposely teaching me, but I was a pretty active person that would pay attention and pay attention. And he was always curious. He was a kind of person that no matter, no matter what the subject was, well, no matter what the subject was, he always had an opinion about it. But also, no matter what the subject was, he was always deeply curious about it, always wanting to learn more about it. And I actually loved that about him. And he seemed to infuse that in our family. I think my brother has a lot of curiosity. My sister does. Our kids do. Just this curiosity about life. It's as if we live life, looking at life with a capital L, with this big question mark. You know, how do things work? Why do things work? Why are things the way they are? Both the good, the bad, and the ugly. If we don't ask questions, we don't get new answers. And so remaining open and remaining curious, being that kind of person that recognizes you don't know everything. We live in a vast, wonderful, mysterious world. I'm seeing a beloved member here, Daryl Rogers, just nodding his head. I'm not sure what you're nodding about, uh, Daryl, but I'm thinking about you because I found myself over the last couple of months for some strange reasons wandering into Home Depot more often than you, and I am lost in that store, but I'm also incredibly curious. I don't know how in the world there are so many doodads and, and screws and nails and nuts and bolts. I was looking for a drill bit for John to hang something on our stucco wall outside, and there must have been 12 feet of drill bits for drywall and glass and metal and I must look so desperate when I'm in that store. I must give out this energy that says, please help me. Because somebody always comes and says, do you need help? Yes, I had no idea there were so many drill pits. I'm curious about them, but I need just one. Can you help me find just the one? You know, there's an energy that we can go through life with that helps us to live it better. 
to be curious. One of the best ways I, can, I think that we can infuse energy and vitality in our relationships, in our work, whether our work is a nine to five type job, if they even exist anymore, or our work is the work we do by choice in retirement, to be curious about it. Is there some other way of approaching it? I mean, have we not had to be incredibly resilient during the pandemic to figure out how to do just the life we did on automatic pilot, some of us, for so many years? You know, remember the days of learning Zoom, right? I don't know what your learning curve was technologically and what things you had to learn, but you had to be flexible. You had to be curious to figure out how do you find your way through or where do you find the answers. So curiosity is a really important practice. It's an important way of being when we're in the midst of being willing to ask those deeper questions. So what now? So what now for my family? So what now for my business? So what now for our community? So what now for our world. Let me be curious. What are the possibilities? And then the last that I want to share with you is the idea and the importance of staying teachable and humble. And I always put those words together because the word humble or the word humility sometimes doesn't rest so well on people. And I think sometimes it's because we look at the word humble or humility, and we somehow think it means less than, not as good as. And I don't, and I don't believe the dictionary defines it that way, but sometimes it doesn't matter what the dictionary defines. We adopt a, a more cultural, social definition to words. But to be humble is to be teachable. It's to be open. There's a word in Japanese, and I don't know if I'm saying it, properly, I think it's pr pronounced shoshin, and it is to convey the idea of the beginner's mind. The idea being that no matter how much you have practiced something or how much you know about something, to always be willing to continue to engage with that something with the beginner's mind, meaning the recognition that there's still more for me to learn about that thing whether it may be meditation, whether it may be my profession, whether it may be how I parent, but to be humble about it, to be teachable about it. It is to be open-ended. One of the things I've always respected about Unity is something that Unity's co-founder, Charles Fillmore, insisted upon about unity. And I think it's one of the reasons that of the New Thought teachings, unity is the largest and, and is very strong, contrasting, and I don't mean this with any disrespect, but contrasting it to what has happened over many years to the teaching of Christian science, for example. And the difference I want to point out here is that in unity, one of the things that Charles Fillmore stood for was that as a teaching, we needed to be open-ended. We needed to be open at the top, meaning that if science or something else came into consciousness that proved a principle or an idea that we believed in was wrong, that we needed to adopt that which was higher or true or, or right, that we needed to be open-ended, that he and Myrtle, even though they founded this movement rather reluctantly, they didn't want to, it wasn't their intention per se, that we must be open-ended, which is, I believe, to be teachable, to be humble. And you contrast that, for example, those of you who know something of our New Thought history, with, say, Christian Science and the founder of Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Baker Eddy believed that what she taught, what came through to her, was absolutely true and right and could never be deviated from. And any belief system any structure, any government for that matter, that is so rigid that there's no room for exploration or change at the top, the top level of thinking, the top level of being, is doomed for its own death. Why? Because all of life is growing forward, onward, and upward. All of life 
and I have to be mindful of time here, but all of life, if we look at evolutionary biology, which is a fascinating spiritual subject, if we look at that, all of life is forever transcending and including, building upon what was, and creating more sophisticated systems. That's how we got to be us. We are the result of an evolutionary process. And you and I, in our teaching, whether we recognize it or not, are in a teaching that believes that we can cooperate with that force of life to consciously co-create a different expression of what it is to be a human being, and therefore a different world that would, will evolve out of that. So bringing it back to a more personal place, I really encourage you to seize this time and to sit quietly for a while in these deeper questions for yourself. What now? What now for you? What now for your life? What do you want to do? Is it different than what you were doing before? Who do you want to be? Is it different than who you were before? And how do you want to be? Is it different than how you were before? And then be willing to listen to what comes, and notice what comes up. Say yes to it. At least say yes to a tiny part of it if you can't say yes to all of it. Be curious about it. And be teachable and humble. Namaste.